excited to kick off what is going to be a very fun few days for us, or a couple of days for us. And again, I, I, my name is Romy, and I'm looking forward to interacting with everybody throughout the course of these days. So um, when they asked me to give this talk, they, they were trying to push me a little bit outside of my comfort zone, which typically I have no problem doing. Um, and they wanted me to talk about some of, uh, try to frame some of the more interesting problems or some of the more intriguing problems in the space of computation and theory and bio biology and chemistry. And so I've tried to do that, but also to, to stay true to myself and sort of what I have interest in. So it won't be maybe as broad as what everybody dreams of, but it's, it's, my, it's my attempt to really sort of get at uh, some fundamental concepts in theory and computation that will allow us to really ultimately predict chemistry in a cellular context. OK, and so, um, so how many folks in here are actually computational and theoretical? A handful, OK, so not, not so bad. OK, that's great. All right, so um, I usually just like to sort of start my talks reminding everyone, including myself, what an exciting time it, it is to be a computational uh, scientist and theoretician, um, and really what I'm showing here, I mean, we all know this uh, because we've had really tr meteoric rise in compute power over the past couple of decades and different types of architectures also, right? And so um, I think probably many of us here in this room, I would hope, sort of already um, are very uh, believing in the idea that it's really the convergence of high-performance computing together with advances in data science, which I will talk about in, this, in my talk today, um, and data, new and emerging sources of uh, experimental data of all types and kinds, that really will be, it's sort of the, the convergence of all of these that's going to really enable transformative advances at the intersection of observational and simulation sciences. And so, um, uh, you know, like it's not just these large sort of supercomputing architectures and what they call the leadership class computing facilities uh, that have hundreds of thousands of cores in a single uh, structure or hardware architecture along with, um, it's also been really, these, these can also be uh, accelerated by graphical processing units, um, but it's also um, been really sort of transformative advances in our ability to map scientific computations in this space of sort of computational biophysics in particular to these GPU architectures that are bringing uh, really supercomputing to individual desktops. And so that's also sort of something transformative that I'll come back to, uh, uh, to you know, sort of within the talk. And again, so, um, it's really that research breakthroughs will occur at the interface of observational and simulation science, and this is really going to be true uh, for all types and areas of science, from environmental and atmospheric chemistry to energy and materials, um, sort of, you know, to address really the big outstanding challenges like climate change and sustainable energy. But really what I'm going to focus mostly on in this particular talk is, is in sort of biology and medicine, um, because that's really sort of the focus interest here. Okay, and so because we have sort of a very broad audience, I'm not going to show really any equations. Is that possible? Or not too many. Um, uh, we, we can talk about those at the bar or wherever you want. Um, but really sort of the, the overarching analogy that I like to use for the approaches where uh, that the sort of that I'm interested in, I think many is, are interested in also sort of a resonating analogy is one of a computational microscope. Right, and so the idea is really that we want to numerically encode uh, different types of equations, uh, different types of equations that represent uh, the structure and the dynamics and the interactions of biomolecules and their interactions with chemical constituents. And then um, starting from experimental data, so for example, X-ray crystal structures or NMR spectroscopy or cryo-EM, et cetera, um, we then can use computing and, uh, and theory to augment and extend where we can sort of go with current experiments. And I think that to me is one of the most exciting, uh, one of the most exciting things that computation can bring to, uh, to the study of uh, biological and biomedical research. So one example of that, um, you know, is that typically, um, 
or one very sort of prolific area where we have a lot of data of biological structure, X-ray crystal structures, and these are really resolving sort of high resolution pictures or static snapshots essentially of different biomolecules. And what we can do with approaches like molecular dynamic simulations um, uh, is, is to allow these computational approaches to basically enable us to get a view of how these molecules actually might move on short time scales. So what I'm showing here is actually um, uh, a, sort of the, a small bit of the p53 protein or transcription factor. This is the DNA binding domain of p53. And you, the wiggling and jiggling that you're looking at is basically just a looped movie over maybe some tens of nanoseconds of dynamics. Uh, and you can see how sort of flexible that this, um, this molecule is. And there's one cysteine here that's sort of bopping in and out. And so, you know, so why do we care? What's one of the interesting things that computing uh, has brought us here uh, is what we saw, if you actually look at all of the structures of P53 in the protein data bank, all the experimentally resolved, very beautiful structures, what you see, and there's over 100 of them now, what you see is actually um, in that area of that particular cysteine, there's really, uh, that cysteine is sort of tucked back, it's occluded from solvent, there's not really any sort of large pocket in that area. And what I just, as I just showed you, there is a lot of flexibility and mobility that the computational approaches predict. Um, and uh, what we see in this particular area is this sort of, uh, this, this sort of pocket, this. Uh, area near the cysteine, actually, the cysteine sort of exposes itself, and a large sort of pocket basically opens up there. All right, so we see this new site open through these simulations. And not only do we see the site open, but then we can use other types of computation to sort of try to predict how well molecules might bind into this site. Um, and um, so this is an approach uh, developed by Sandra Vaja called computational solvent mapping. And basically what it's doing is basically trying to, uh, it floods the surface of the protein with different organic probes and then uh, sort of uh, uses a physics-based interaction potential to determine where these probes have a high propensity to bind. And so what that tells us is that not only does the, uh, the pocket open, but it also gives us a sense for how druggable that pocket is, and then you can imagine, as, as we did, we basically did small molecule docking into this site, and we're able to discover a series of uh, compounds that basically reactivated P53 in, uh, in, in, in cancer cell lines. And so um, I actually am required to tell you that I'm a co-founder of a company called Actavalon, which is sort of trying to translate some of these molecules to bring to use in patients. But the general idea here, and one of the things that um, uh, that I, we get very excited about is, so we, you know, we have this, this, these sort of these high resolution structures, and now we can use computing and modeling to basically um, accelerate predictions of where uh, chemistry can happen, where reactivation can happen, and sort of advance, uh, more rapidly advance therapeutic design. But it's not all roses, right? So that there's a lot of challenges and things that we need to be thinking about as uh, computationalists and theorists. Things that plague us, also experimentally, of course, are things like rigor and reproducibility, also scalability, and for computational people, not to get too computational about it, uh, but are uh, things like interoperability. And so what I mean by that is that, um, okay, so we have this method now where um, we can maybe use simulation-based approaches to try to come up with small molecules, but that experiment, that end-to-end -end experiment is actually really complicated and has a lot of decisions that have to be made at the desk with a researcher. And of course, many of these decisions are not really hard-coded to um, into the methods that make it into the published literature and so on and so forth. So one big area that computationalists are sort of working on now, including us and others, and I encourage folks also to think about, are things like workflows, automated workflows. And this also can inform experimental design uh, for image acquisition, image processing, et cetera. So this is just one example of, um, of a technique that's really, I think, coming to the fore. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, where computation can really help inform biological experiments. And so this now very complicated 100-step end-to-end workflow can be sort of automated every step of the way. And so what different, a whole bunch of different decisions are basically, I'm sort of hiding them inside these boxes. And one of the nice things about this is that, of course, once you create this workflow, 
you can easily sort of redo the experiments. You can do this in really fully reproducible ways. You can scale its execution to different types of computational architectures. So not just your own lab machines, but also you could scale it to the Exceed resources and you could scale it to the Amazon cloud, et cetera. And it really helps us compare uh, and contrast methods. Now the other issue that uh, if we really wanna try to get at understanding uh, chemistry in the cell, we have to really um, focus on reliability. So how good are these predictions that we're making for, for example, free energies of binding? Um, and so um, I, I'm, I'm sort of going to want to touch on one way that we are trying to address reliability as an example to sort of show how, you know, we could maybe apply the same uh, sort of approach to different areas. Okay, and so um, together with Mike Gilson, I run something called the Drug Design Data Resource. And this is an NIH-sponsored effort that basically all, we are really trying to drive advances in CAD or computer-rated drug design methods by, um, by we basically uh, extract high-quality um, drug binding data sets. So this is in the form of uh, crystal structures, high resolution crystal structures in complex with different sort of small molecule compounds and affinity um, or sort of binding, basically uh, measures of binding affinity such as KDs or IC50s. And basically then um, we hold these blinded prediction challenges for the community to basically test uh, how well their methods do. Because a lot of times when people are developing methods, what they're doing is they're testing it retrospectively on data that's already out there. So um, this allows really fully blinded data sets to identify how well people are really doing um, and to try to make more predictive uh, computational methods that benefit everyone. And so until recently, the approach that they've taken and that we've taken too um, over the past 10 years through this resource has been to have what are the sort of challenges that happen once a year or once every two years. And so we have uh, data sets, as I mentioned, from different, uh, different pharmaceutical companies like AbbVie and Genentech, and we maybe have one or two targets per year. So this is what we used in 2015. There were about 35 groups around the world that participated. In 2016, it went up to about 50. We only had one target here, but what, you, what we see is that over time, this, you know, we might be able to learn something uh, about these methods on these particular data sets, but we never have enough to really be statistically rigorous or statistically significant and to be able to say sort of meaningful observations about how accurate these methods are across really a diversity of different targets as one would need to do in order to really reliably predict chemistry. Uh, actually in a cellular environment. So what we did was recently we partnered with the Protein Data Bank and to sort of move us towards greater statistical power, and one of the, what, what I like about this is sort of it allows us to take advantage of data sources that already exist, but to use them in new ways that can address key challenges for a whole field. So what we've done now, we partnered with the PDB and they release their structures every Wednesday. And so what we do on Saturday, they give, a, they give us sort of a preview of what's gonna come in the form of uh, information about small molecules in the form of inchy strings, but that's like a technicality, and the, the protein sequences. And then we release um, these little data packages on a weekly basis for these structures that are coming into the PDB. These are structures that you know, are from all over the place. So they represent a very, very wide range of different kinds of targets, different kinds of ligands, et cetera. So um, what we found, so we call this kelp for, uh, because you know, we come from a place where there's kelp in the ocean and also because um, uh, it stands for continuous evaluation of ligand po uh, pose prediction. So this has been launched now for about a little over a year. And even in just this, this span of a year, we've been able to uh, amass over 2,000 different data sets uh, that have been bl tested, uh, blindly tested by the community. And these are all, um, which, is, which is already in order of magnitude more data and statistics than the whole of the nine years of the previous efforts combined. And so this was just by taking advantage of something that was already there, but using it in a new way. And I think that is something that's sort of like a, you know, like a nugget that we hope to keep with us that we can apply from other, uh, to other areas also.
Um, the other thing that we did here actually is we changed the turnaround time. So uh, on our grand challenges, I guess I didn't really tell you here, but we typically we would give folks these carefully curated sets for one or two molecules, and then we would give them one or two months to make the predictions, and they would go back to their labs, and they would run all their scripts, and then they would submit the predictions, and everybody waits, and then we talk about it, we publish papers. But now, there's no time for that. We're giving you the stuff on Sunday, and we need it back before the real results come out, which are Wednesday. So now you gotta turn this around in two days' time. So what does that mean? It means everything is now going toward automation. But again, what that allows us to do is to capture these complex workflows, so these are all now, in order to even participate, so sort of trying to shift the field to this way where we now have a full description of methods. You can share these workflows. You're ensuring reproducibility. You're evaluating them constantly on new data sets. And the cool thing is once you have these encoded, um, you can apply them to different drug design projects. You can share them, et cetera. So, I mean, in the space of drug binding, what we want to do is now move it just from looking at post prediction of drugs to actually looking at binding affinities. Again, this ties intimately to the theme of the talk, which is trying to predict chemistry in a cellular context, because if we can't even faithfully predict how, a how well a molecule is binding to something else, some other molecule, then we're really not gonna get very far. Um, okay, and there's all sorts of efforts uh, at the NSF also trying to help in this, uh, in this particular space. Okay, um, and so, Everything I've talked about so far is basically single molecules, right? Um, single proteins, et cetera. But, um, and this is where, in fact, we tr tend to focus a lot of our effort and our thinking uh, is on these sort of highly idealized systems and essentially infinitely dilute so solutions, at least computationally, or of course, you know, there's sort of experimental equivalents to this. But of course, the reality is that these proteins are in, you know, a much more complicated biological environment. Um, and we ultimately really want to be able to capture, describe, simulate, predict how these environments are really behaving. At least that's a dream of mine and I think many people. Um, so how are we gonna do that? Um, well, I mean, I, I would argue, and I think probably many people would agree that really what it's gonna take is really sort of a multi-scale approach, right? Um, and we can use computation to uh, to basically try to inform different scales of science uh, and, and, and sort of under, so that we can ultimately understand phenomena like the molecular underpinnings of disease or how small changes at the molecular level sort of play out in their subcellular context in the cell and you know, even to the tissue uh, to evolve and uh, regulate sort of emergent behavior. Um, and I think this, so what I'm showing here is sort of the typical multi-scale, you know, sort of image, and there's many different renditions of this. I've tried to give the simplest one possible. But it's like we have these approaches for, many times we have approaches at particular scales that are really good, you know, for, in this sort of niche, right? And this could exist for molecular and macromolecular simulations. If at the subcellular simulation, we can use things like Brownian dynamics. If we want to try to, there's ways that we can try to look at whole cells um, using more stochastic approaches or reaction diffusion equation uh, sort of approaches. Um, but what we really want to do is try to go into and across these key capability gaps um, in order to give unseen views and to make these new discoveries into the inner working of cells at the molecular level. And often also it's that experimentally we can't really go there, right? And so um, because of imaging limitations and experimental limitations, so computing can sort of take us there and, um, and show us new things. Um, so I'm not, and I'm supposed to keep this at 35 minutes. I see I'm at 22 already. Um, so um, there's a lot of algorithmic challenges and I cannot talk about all of them, nor do I necessarily even really have the expertise. So I'm sorry to all the quantum chemists out there in the audience who are probably horrified. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm gonna sort of stay away from really uh, any sort of detailed description of uh, looking at chemical reactivity or embedding methods for QMMM, but these are approaches that you know a lot of people are working on and that need to be addressed in order to really faithfully and seamlessly allow us to sort of cross scales in the space of biological and chemical uh, simulation. Okay, so I would say to stay true to myself, it's not only computing that we're really excited about, 
but also data. And I, also, I already mentioned data at sort of the smallest scale that I'll talk about, the molecular scale, um, where we can have either uh, X-ray crystallography or electron crystallography getting us to, to really beautiful resolution of, uh, of sort of single uh, protein structures. Of course, many people are very interested and very excited about cryo-electron uh, microscopy, cryo-EM. And so there's been really, because of uh, a lot of really uh, tremendous technological advances uh, in phase place technology and direct detector technology, they now are able to uh, get at near atomic resolution for some systems using cryo-EM. Um, in the same sort of modality of, uh, of cryo is sort of electron tomography where they can now sort of make these very thin slices of cells and then image uh, and image those and sort of intact cells that have been sort of vitrified, right? So now what we're doing is um, we can understand sort of Hopefully you can sort of see where I'm headed here, but how we can sort of evolve a sort of a nested or hierarchical understanding of the high resolution uh, structure within and how that might sit within its uh, within a, 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 a supermolecular complex, how that complex sits within the cell, and then um, using resin embedded methods, we can now start to look again at the next scales of complexity up to these really sort of whole tissue samples where they have these tissues inside uh, of, of these scopes. And basically, you know, it'll image one layer, shave off a thin slice, image another layer, et cetera, et cetera. These microscopes will run for days at a time and generate giant data sets uh, that have hundreds of thousands of these small structures, you know, within these data sets. And so, Okay, so the dream is really, I think, I mean, I, I think a very exciting area at least will be to use or somehow figure out how to integrate these 3D structural data to build computationally manipulatable, um, simulatable, uh, visible virtual cells, if you will, right? And there are so many challenges and opportunities in this space. Um, data complexities is, uh, at many different levels, right? So imaging segmentation and refinement, there's a lot of very creative work that needs to be done there so that we can figure out exactly what the heck we're really looking at in these samples. Um, and also, for example, at each of those other scales, like with cryo and, uh, and x-ray crystallography, um, we can, there's, again, a lot of opportunity to figure out how to get more out of the data that we have. So for cryo-EM, is there any way to derive dynamics from all of the different sort of groupings that they have? And there's people you know, trying to work on this, uh, but this is a space where there's lots to be done. Also diffuse scatter, so the information that we typically ignore it's there, how can we use it to, for example, better refine our force field methodologies or our force or our uh, dynamics? And then uh, I see, obviously, a big challenge area in data integration. How do we bring these diverse data sets together, um, ultimately to really extend molecular structure to cellular environments so that we can really have a, pic a really sort of accurate picture of how these molecules will move around um, inside these very complex scenes. So one way to do that um, is to really uh, to, uh, is through a tool called CellPack, but there's of course many other ways that people can address these challenges. Um, CellPack is a tool that's developed at the resource that I direct and also um, uh, at the Scripps Research Institute. Um, it's a cell-centered, data-centric modeling framework, right? And so what we can do is we can tie in or we can input all different types of data. It could be structural data, it could be fluorescence data, tomography data, it could be proteomics data, you can, you know, if you can, uh, if you want to include it and you can get at that data, you can include it. And what you do is then you use this data to create different recipes, okay, that um, describe your system, all right? So you can define different compartments of your system. So um, where you have maybe the interior compartment and you also have surface ingredients. And you know, it could have, if you know sort of the, uh, the stoichiometry of the different molecular ingredients, if you happen to know their structures, um, and same with the surface, you can then actually, the cell pack will basically generate 
um, these uh, these models um, that have that basically satisfy these constraints that you've fed in from the data, um, but in different ways, right? So it used to be that even to build one of these complex systems would take you know really years of very careful curation. Um, but through ad through advances like this and through advances yet to come, um, you know we can now build models like this much more rapidly. So you can build not just one, to that'll take you months or years to build, but in a matter of minutes, you can actually have an ensemble of models that satisfy all the data. And this actually helps us get a sense for biological heterogeneity, for example, how all the different ways that you could satisfy particular uh, data restraints and still, um, you know, how that might look in terms of the complexity of the structure and the underlying ingredients. And membranes, so um, membranes are difficult, right? They are tough <laughs> um, experimentally and also computationally. So um, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity in the space of membrane, uh, membrane modeling, membrane reorganization. Um, one tool that we have developed that integrates with CellPack now is something called lipid wrapper. So this allows us to build all atom lipid bilayers with realistic geometries. Um, and uh, so we can basically, you can define any surface and basically wrap these lipids into, you know, into your, into your system. And so what tools like this allow us to do are basically to move from single protein investigations where a lot of folks have been focused to systems that uh, are, have, uh, you know, a much higher degree of complexity. And so one nice example involves uh, influenza, and so I'm showing here some cryo-electron tomography data by Alistair Stephen uh, at the NIH. And using uh, these tools and other tools, we were able to create a fully atomic reconstruction of the flu virus, and um, we can basically fit in these high-resolution uh, sort of structures from X-ray crystallography into where they are specified by the maps in the in the in the cryo-electron tomography, and you know there's many reasons why we want to do this. Um, I think many of them will be obvious, hopefully, to people in this room, where we can now really have an improved sense of the physical arrangement of the biological entities within this complex scene. We can now begin to study simultaneously um, multiple components in the system, see their correlations, et cetera. And then once we have this framework to basically build these biological systems, we can um, you know, use them as a platform to launch various types of uh, biophysical type simulations. And one of the things to me that's the most exciting and also sometimes can be the most frustrating, especially when you're writing proposals, um, is, uh, you know, we uh, very often, obviously, you know, sort of how things are set up is sort of hypothesis-driven research, hypothesis-driven research. And it is very important, you know, for the whole framework. Um, but it doesn't take you very long to work in an area like this, and I'm sure many of you have had this experience where you are working on something and you articulate a particular hypothesis, but really, um, at the end of the day, because you've sort of converge things and, and increase the complexity to some extent that you had never seen before, that you, it brings, it sort of think, it brings insights and hypotheses that you really couldn't even have imagined when you first set out and when you were so focused on a single component. And um, I don't know, to me this is uh, really very exciting. So, um, so uh, just one example of how computing can be used to inform these now large and complex data sets. So, you know, we built this virus and um, simulated it using NAMD2, which is a terrific molecular dynamics engine developed in Urbana. Um, we ran it on Blue Waters, which is also in Urbana, <laughs> um, which is this sort of mega computing system. And, uh, you know, actually in the day, we were able to get about five nanoseconds per day using, you know, some hundreds of thousands of CPUs. Now, actually, we can get up, uh, it's, a, it's actually about three or four fold that speed using the same number of CPUs because they've done such a great job optimizing that code. Um, we also, this makes these systems, as fun as they are to explore and investigate, they make huge amounts of data that really, really challenge visualization, interaction, and analysis. It breaks, they break every program you make. They, they, they need more memory, but, you know, this is really, you know, there are always commensurate increases in hardware and new, um, 
new uh, sort of advances in hardware architectures that sort of help do this sort of uh, this sort of push and pull between the edge of technology development and um, and sort of where we can go with science. Okay, so um, so we were able to simulate about 160 nanoseconds of this huge virus. And of course, if, if you're thinking on a biological time scale, you're thinking, what are you going to see in 160 nanoseconds for this massive system? Um, and you know what? If you overlap the first structure that you that we started simulating with the last structure that we got, they basically look the same. You know, you're not seeing any sort of large reorganization or anything like that. Um, so you know, there's. Uh, this is this is clearly a limitation at this time um, with these systems of this size, although there are others who have already extended systems of nearly this size uh, out, I think, to uh, microseconds now. But um, one thing we didn't anticipate when we first started building this system, but that came about was um, there was sort of a new analysis method. So it's not just data, it's not just the computing, but advances in analysis methods, particularly related to sort of the statistics-based analysis. And a really powerful framework is something called Markov State Model Theory, which is develop has been developed by a whole bunch of really great people um, who I uh, should give more fine detailed credit to, but I don't because I'm trying to cover this topic very quickly. Um, but the idea is that um, you don't, if you want to understand the long time scale dynamics of a system, one way to do that is to just simulate that thing for a really long time, right? But another way to do it is actually to break it up and to run many, many short time scale simulations. And then you can basically discretize, you discretize, in, in this sense, we discretize the whole, all these different copies of the virus uh, proteins. So there's like, 200 and some pro copies of the hemagglutinin and on the virus, we treated each one of those like a separate entity. And then you can create, you can basically stitch together essentially what is a network of states. So you can group them into different uh, sort of structures and then you can determine the rates of transition between the different states. And so at the end of the day, what this allows you to do is to extract long time scale dynamics from many short time scale simulations. And this is really emerging as a very powerful approach uh, in the space of uh, biophysical simulation. How am I doing on time? I'm probably getting close to the end. Um, all right, and so what does this allow us to do? Well, it allows us to really more rigorously characterize uh, things like drug binding, substrate interaction, loop motion in proteins. Uh, et cetera, and we can also help characterize where these, or better characterize where small molecules and other ligands will bind. Um, I had to put this in, um, you know, another sort of unappreciated, I think, or underappreciated source of complexity has to do with things like glycans. Um, and of course, in the flu, originally we and others, we always sort of tend to ignore them computationally, but uh, this is sort of, this is really an area where, um, uh, you know, there's a huge uh, impact in terms of cellular biology and molecular biology that we really are just beginning to understand. And, and so, um, uh, you know, sort of increasing the complexity of these systems is something uh, uh, that obviously that we want to continue to push on. And, and we currently are doing that by adding uh, sort of realistic glycans to, to sort of these large structures. Um, and then, you know, in terms of trying to really under, so that was still really at the very small scale, small time and length scale, really. Um, so how can we extend that basically by using different uh, sort of simulation approaches? And so it's not only that we can build these systems now and study them using all atom MD where every single atom is wiggling and jiggling. We really might not want to do that. Um, so we're also developing in others and where it spaces for opportunity where people need to, I think, continue to work is in, um, is in development of Brownian dynamics simulations and other types of uh, approaches that allow us to sort of go farther out to time and length scales. And so in Brownian dynamics simulations, we're basically looking at the rigid body diffusion of, for example, a drug molecule to the different sites, in this case, on the virus. Um, and in this case, actually, it's quite interesting because these sialic acid receptors 
or these sialic acid um, molecules, they basically mimic sort of these terminal groups on the cell receptors, and they can actually bind to a whole bunch of different sites on either of these proteins. And so by, um, and this is something that generally is sort of difficult to get at in terms of trying to understand really a molecular understanding of what's going on for uh, binding to different sites and so on. Um, experimentally. So uh, computation here allows us to sort of get a better view into that. And I'm probably completely running out of time, but what we can do now, if I can have two more minutes, is um, to build, you know, different kinds of systems. So in this case, we have reconstructed different types of the flu virus, where we're basically matching the sequences, and here they're shown in sort of this maybe strange representation where you don't see the atoms, because I want you to focus on other things, but these are actually all atom models of these different flu viruses. And we can do things, um, we can build these now very rapidly and look at things like how, for example, stock height, so you see this guy here that looks like a broccoli, he's much shorter than this one over here. This is, um, it turns out that in some strains, in some of the, the most virulent strains of the flu, there's a stock deletion in neuraminidase. And so what these models allow us to do is actually to see how this sort of lowering uh, relative to the other proteins on the surface, the hemagglutinins, how the sort of lowering of the neuraminidase actually affects substrate binding because these uh, molecules have remarkably different electrostatic profiles. And so we can sort of start to get a real, really sort of a close sense for that. And then, um, this is probably getting too much into my own research, but uh, what we also want to do is really, again, to develop multi-scale methods that allow us to, for example, um, can I go back one? When the molecules are far away from each other and we don't uh, care so much about fine-grained sort of uh, rearrangements of the different species, we can use rigid body type approaches, but as these molecules get closer, then we can actually engage fully flexible molecular dynamic simulations. And so this is an approach that we've developed. It's one approach, there's many approaches to try to do this, but where we're actually using Brownian dynamics at far distances, coupled together with molecular dynamics at close distances, where we, you know, sort of the fine grain rearrangements really matter. And again, we can bring these two different types of regimes together using a new analysis framework, something called milestoning, um, which is in fact actually very similar to Markov state model theory, but has some sort of nice, nice differences. Um, in any case, so um, sort of wrapping up here, um, really molecular simulation, even over the past five years or so, has really gone, I think, from uh, being routinely able to study sort of single proteins, now to looking at objects that are on the order of 100 nanometers or larger in dimension. And then we are working, we continue to sort of try to push this scale. This is actually um, an image of a dendrit, the actin gel within a dendritic spine. And we've used cell pack technologies together with um, beautiful images created at uh, the, the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research in order to develop these sort of all atom models of this complicated system that are now sort of over sort of a micron in size. And I would just sort of leave you, hopefully, with the idea that these types of methods and approaches ultimately will help bring the study of chemistry uh, into cellular context, where we have all of the complexity, where we're able to ultimately have all the complexity of biology, but also have the accuracy that we need for chemistry. And then, um, and I, although I didn't talk anything at all about reactions at active sites and so forth, you know, there's also, of course, a whole branch uh, of investigation where uh, sort of we can really look very closely at what's happening in terms of the reactivity of molecules um, also. Okay, and with that, I will close. And just acknowledgments, um, you know, I have, I have a terrific group. Uh, at UC San Diego, this is not all of them, but uh, some. I am the director, as I mentioned, of the National Biomedical Computation Resource, and that's been funded uh, by the NIGMS for some number of years. Um, uh, the New Innovator Award program also was fantastic, and I understand there's a whole bunch of new innovators here. It's a terrific program. And uh, all the, the NSF and Blue Waters for Computing, and all of you for your attention. I'm really happy to take questions and continue discussion for the next few days. Time and yeah, exactly. And 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 what's the what's the intuition?
about, are they just sort of the same dimension and you can trade off, or are they sort of fundamentally different if we're looking at long time scale uh, dynamics? Um, you mean in terms of the approaches that one has to use? Yeah, the problems you have to solve, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're, f they, I, th I consider them, I guess, sort of fundamentally different. I mean, you definitely have to change some gears and sort of engage different, uh, different physics, essentially. And I think that's part of the challenge is really sort of understanding where that window needs to shift, you know? And I think it, it depends a lot on what are the questions you're asking, um, you know, and that you're interested to answer, um, and also sort of the capabilities of the technology at the particular time and so forth, right? But um, certainly, of course, size does correlate and couple, size and scale, you need to really obviously also couple to longer time scales also, right, in spatial scale. So long spatial scales, you typically then need to simulate for longer to actually see something interesting, et cetera, yeah. So you can, <laughs> that's swapping. Uh, you can create a huge amount of data with these new tools and new uh, machines. Yeah. You, you were talking about several tens of terabytes, right? Much more than that. Yeah, or, or even more. Um, you mentioned on the fly that uh, you need to develop new tools to analyze this, those data. Are you planning to make, or is it possible to make this data available for other researchers? Because once you answer your question, but there is still 25 terabytes of other questions. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is sort of like something that has to, is, is now in the ether and hopefully it's absorbed into most of us that uh, there is so much value in the data beyond what one cottage laboratory can extract, yeah? And it might be also that it's the integration of different data sets collected at different sites that will yield some kind of new thing, yeah. so. We, so the issue though with sharing these is that uh, it's they're very big and it's very difficult, but I think that there are act, there's a lot of people, and this, I was a little bit worried that uh, the talk might be a little bit too cyber infrastructure-y, because that's a really important component for this work is sort of what are we doing with the data? How are we visualizing it? How are we computing it? Um, but I think that's maybe not so much the interest of folks here. Um, but there are a lot of people thinking very hard about how we can bring these sets, data sets together, how we make them available, and how we change the way investigators interact with the data. So not necessarily that I have to pull the data down from Urbana to San Diego, which is gonna take, I don't even know how long, it's faster for me to basically fly out there with a the student and a disk, <laughs> fly it back. Um, but how we can do remote visualization, et cetera, et cetera. And also I should say too that one of the very exciting things that I didn't show here is something being developed uh, uh, at the Scripps Research Institute are basically new visualization platforms, data visualization platforms that, um, something called CellView, which uh, is just very, uh, using sort of new approaches in, in gaming, they're able to sort of keep uh, very high resolution data when you want it, they can display it, but then hide, you sort of like, when you want, so when you're very close to atoms, if you want to understand what's happening in an active site, you really need to see how the residues are all moving, right? But then as you scale back, you don't want to hold on to the representation of that data at such detail, because it just slows you down. So they have these approaches where they can sort of uh, multi-scale in the visualization space which is again also coupled sort of to the, one of the questions that was asked at the beginning about how these different uh, sort of time and length scale challenges are sort of correlated. Anyway, I'm probably blabbing, blabbing now, but yeah, yeah. question. Uh, so you, you mentioned several computational protocols and we, I, I understand that the goal is to understand and predict chemistry, right, which is going on. And in order to understand chemistry, we need to look at the quantum level, right? To, yes. So could you comment on the role of the hybrid models, which includes quantum mechanical description of active sites and interactions? Of course, and I'm sorry for not really treating that with any kind of rigor or giving, it seems like I don't give it any respect. That's what I was trying to say, which is really not true, but it's just that I only had 35 minutes and so much to say. Um, yeah, of course. 
uh, in order to understand reactivity at active sites or reactivity in general, you have to go to sort of quantum mechanical methods. I think there, there's so many beautiful things being done at the multi-scale approach, things like QM, MM, for example. So if you really want to understand how active site is really s the sort of environment of that is affecting the chemistry, you know, you need to have these multi-scale approaches. Super important. I just didn't talk about it because it's, there was so many other scales to cover. Yeah, more hours. But I know that, of course, and there's, there's really much, much to be done there. Yeah. How about if we do one more question? You can ask me later, Neil. <laughs> okay, I have, I have one question. I'll call it A and B. Um, okay. <laughs> like that is tricky. <laughs> so I guess A would be, um, what are the, so I'm an ex mostly an experiment experimental scientist, but I'm really interested in trying to use computation to inform experiments and go beyond the scale that one can look at uh, necessarily through experiments. So for instance, with the, the virus, what are the sort of experimental methods that you can use to say make a perturbation in your computations of say, say you change the lipid composition of the membrane and then you'd like to see whether or not your you know, resulting calculations as to, say, the distribution of particles are representative of what actually occurs. I mean, how, how do you couple that? And maybe even theoretically, how are you engaging with experiment to ask precise and meaningful questions? Right, OK. Um, well, I should say, actually, pretty much in everything that I do, and I think with many, many of uh, my colleagues, are it's only done really in close collaboration with experimental groups. And this is because you, of course, have to be very careful in system design and construction, and you have to have a really crisp experiment that allows you to, you know, ask a, a question in a way where when you get an answer, it is what you think it is, right? So what would be an example of that, um, where you've sort of made one of these large-scale um, computational predictions and then directly tested it with a concise experiment? Oof. Um, yeah, that's good. OK, so for the large-scale <laughs> for the large scale systems, it has been more, so I have to say too that for this, the largest, the largest scale stuff that I showed you, it's easier to answer that question at the molecular level, right? right. Because I can say, exactly, ah, I it's found easier a to answer and, yeah, at yeah. the molecular scale. Right, right. It's harder for the big scale for two things. First of all, that we're like this data is in, it's in review right now, right? So we're just really publishing it, and it takes time to sort of get to there. Um, but, um, gosh, let me think. Um, 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 you know, I mean, I can, uh, what we've done mostly for the large scale systems has been more of a sort of a retrospective explanation of particular behavior, right? And then what often happens is we can say, we, 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 it seems to be this in the paper, we sort of speculate that, you know, whatever result we have is due to X, Y, Z, and then Actually, sometimes what happens in the case with the flu was then a couple years later, an experimental group actually tests some hypothesis and sort of then shows, you know, some prediction that we made and sort of shows that. That was the case um, with this secondary site, which I didn't really get into the details of the flu, and I'm happy to do that with you, you know, anytime or with anybody anytime. But basically, um, there's a secondary site on the neuraminidase enzyme, and people have for a long time wondered what binds there and how. And we use these simulations to basically suggest that actually association to the secondary site was faster than it was to the primary site for some particular molecules. And, a, and we made this prediction sort of, you know, in the literature, and then a year or two later, they actually show that this was the case with um, saturation transfer difference on MR spectroscopy. Uh, so that was just one example. But I think going forward, you know, another key question is how do you really validate, you know, a lot of what you're seeing? And I think this is really where this sort of push and pull between computation and experiment is really sort of happening. And uh, it sort of, it takes a long time to get there. Thank you.